So let's go the opposite way. We've talked about going up. Let's talk about going down. So in the past, you've mentioned formation burrows and then escape burrows. Uh, what are they and how do they differentiate? So we um, started seeing animals run into burrows. Um, and as I said, they were reluctant to go in the burrows if you could see them. And then if they went in and then we realized and most of them that they run into, um, you know, they all seem to be this kind of like an entrance hole and then like a bell shaped area. Well, not a bell. It's kind of like a elliptical area. And then they'd run in and then they'd wedge themselves up against the edge of it as an escape. So obviously, you know, they're quite rough as well. And they kind of wedge themselves in there and can't get out. And, um, you know, it's quite open. They have, lots of room to turn around in and everything like that. And then we have uh, the brumation burrows. And we've uncovered a few ones that have been brumating. And they're always... So we uncovered one that was in a sand bank on the edge of the road. And he was coming out. And we looked down it. And it was tight. You know, he would have to really squeeze in there nice and tight to use that. And then we had another dragon, which was, um, there was this log lying in the sand and it was right up the end of it, quite deep underneath. It. And, um, it was quite tight, actually. Um, we just found it because we flipped the log and it was quite a long log. Um, and where they brewmate, it tends to be quite a bit deeper than these escape burrows. These escape burrows, they pretty much only use during the active season. Um, they will sleep in them only for a short period in the spring and late autumn when the nighttime temperatures get really cold um, still and the daytime temperatures are getting really warm. Um, but once, once you get to the end of spring, the nighttime temperatures have risen to, you know, above 15 degrees and they'll sleep out in the open because they do not like being in um, cornered in a burrow obviously the predators out there um, uh, because they have blind ended tunnels um, the predators out there you've got you know numerous species of snake which prey on them and are active at night so they want to spend as little time in an escape burrow as they need to because they're cornered, um, but the brumation burrows uh, are very tight, um, well insulated, um, but also you get ones that are, so if a bearded dragon, it either chooses a really deep, like the deep one in the sand bank was about more than 30 centimetres deep in that sand bank, um, and, you know, from other studies on uh, burrowing mammals that burrow in the same area, um, and have similar length and depth burrows. Um, during the winter, it stays at about 15 degrees Celsius the whole of winter. There is very little fluctuation there. Whereas the bearded dragons, there are some bearded dragons that will choose a more shallow burrowing site and it will fluctuate between being like less than 10 degrees at night and then getting the sun of the day, even though it's 21 degrees or 18 degrees outside it still gets up to about 17 degrees underneath there. And those ones will actually come out during the um, warmer days in winter. We do have most of the time where they're found, it can be anywhere between 12 and 21 usually during the winter. But then um, some of those days, sometimes you get a hot spell in the middle of winter and it's 23 to 25 degrees, 27 degrees, and they'll actually come out the bars and then go back into that uh, shallower brumation burrow under a log or something like that. So. so I've seen you say before in the past that um they need sort of like 23, uh, 21 degrees to 23 degrees air temperature before they start to emerge and start to have a little bit of a bask at the end of brumation. Uh, why do some captivity remain sleeping even when the temperatures in their environment well exceed an air temperature of like 21? Because I've done it as well because I've I've obviously looked at everything you've said online and I've like played with it and like seen, I was like, I wonder if I'll see it like a 23, she'll like wake up or something, but yeah. I could have it like 27. She's like sleep for another month sort of thing. Yeah. And are you taking a 
the body temperature of the bearded dragon or that's the air temperature in the enclosure air temperature could you describe yeah. the air temperature so I start with yeah. that. because we've had one of the dragons that was still brumating its air temperature was 22 or 23 degrees the surface temperature of the burrow was 20 degrees but the actual temperature of the bearded dragon was 11 degrees so um you know you can look at the 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 body temperature of the bearded dragon that's one thing but having said that that was based off Adam's study and what we're seeing as well no one fully understands brumation in reptiles and what the cues are to get them out of brumation we don't know whether they can detect barometric changes so what happens in Australia during the different seasons, the high pressure cell, it goes, as you go down the, um, the, the latitude, you get high pressure system, low pressure system, high pressure system, and that shifts between summer and winter. So we don't know whether they're detecting that. Um, you know, it's not, it's not, um, daylight length. Because if they're hidden underneath there, they can't detect it. Um, we don't know about electromagnetic fields either, changes there. There actually is a study where they, they did a study on the, um, parietal eye and they only gave it a certain wavelength of light and they realized that it needed to be exposed to a certain wavelength of light otherwise it couldn't detect electromagnetic changes in navigation that that was actually in lizards that's an actual study um so whether they can detect that and um well obviously they can detect electromagnetic um directions and stuff like that um but yeah well, no one fully understands brumation um you know we use the term brumation it was created by someone um but these days amongst scientists they actually go you know what it is hibernation it's not brumation hibernation in a bear hibernation in a reptile you know it's the same it is there is no need to distinguish but i don't think anyone fully understands the cues um in brumation slash hibernation uh, but we can go off what evidence we do have and what we found and what Batam found and that's um, what we're going off. But there definitely could be other factors that we, we can't, we don't know. We don't know where to look. We're not measuring it right. So. Um, what are your recommendations for brumation and captivity? So um, I know there's two methods um, which are regularly used. Um, there is, you know, they go to roommate, they go down for a week. Okay. They're definitely not coming out, switch off everything. And then once the weather turn warms up, switch it back on and go from there. Um, you know, that's good if they're brumating and you can get your temperature below, you know, 15 degrees reliably and it will stay below 15 degrees Celsius the whole time. But. From what we see in the wild, where they're coming out, if there's warm days, when the air temperatures are getting to, you know, 25, 27 degrees. So they will come out in bars. So a lot of people who are keeping bearded dragons where the nighttime temperatures aren't low and if there is a warm day or the apartments at 21 or something, um, I say to still provide heat and basking spot at the same 42 degrees, but just for shorter hours four to six hours a day, just in case you do have a barometric change and the weather outside does warm up so that in, your ambient temperatures inside do warm up and then they can come out and bask for a few hours. And I've kept bearded dragons that way. Um, I still provide them with heat, but just at shorter times. So, um, you know, reduce it from 12 hours a day to eight hours a day to six hours a day down to four hours a day right at the winter solstice uh, and then go back the other way and still give them the opportunity and i used to keep all my 
reptiles and dragons in a garage. So it's, it's, it, if it's, if you get a warm winter day, you do get warm air temperatures in there. And they did, if, if it was more than 21, 22 inside the garage when it happened, um, they would come out and bath. And then as soon as those few days of heat were over, um, and it went back to being cold temperatures again, they would just stay down. But I still have the light on and just for the reduced hours. So, so there's the two ways there. Um, yeah, it's always hard to really recommend a hard and fast because it's very much dependent on how you keep them, where you keep them in your house and what they're exposed to um, as well as temperatures. So. Here's a question for you. I know you like this one. So what are your thoughts on bearded dragons in the Northern Hemisphere sleeping during the summer here? And then people saying, oh, it's them brumating because they're like instinctually remembering that it would be winter in Australia this time of year. So, um, no, that's not, that's, so what we did experience, so we went out late summer one year and this was during, um, my study was done during Australia's, you know, centenary drought like one of the worst droughts we've seen it peaked in those you know massive bushfires and everything like that and we went out there and the summer we it was end of summer like late february early march and the days were like 40 degrees and the nights hadn't been below 30 degrees for a month and we saw no bearded drag why because and and this is typical in the hottest part of the year breeding activity stops at around christmas the summer solstice and then you get this intense heat where the nighttime temperatures stay high so they instinctively in the peak of summer they estivate why because in the peak of summer there's no food around it's too hot for any greenery um so they're not out because it's too hot the higher temperature they are their metabolism increases and they use up food reserves so in the wild when it gets to the hottest part of summer they will stay in their escape burrows or stay sheltered out of the sun trying to stay as cool as possible and don't bask because basking is causing them to you know use up energy which really you're in an arid environment and they don't have that energy available and it's not until you get to the end of depending on what the season's like until those temperatures and not time temperatures start coming down and then they'll start coming out the thing that cues them to come out and start basking is the rain because when the rain comes termites come to the surface and then they start they so they get water and they get food and then they need to metabolize that so it's not this throwback to, you know, my Australian ancestors in the outback. It's they're doing what they're meant to do, which is reduce the basking, reduce using up energy until further later in the season when the food supply becomes more prominent. Even though, you know, there's someone there giving them greens and as many woodies as uh, as many roaches they can eat within 15 minutes type thing even though there's heaps of food that no, their instinct tells them no this is the peak the days are the longest um to preserve myself um and use the least amount of energy as possible uh what would you say like when some i think some people my bear dragon would just sit in the corner in the cool end and just sit there and just watch the day go by when it's this time of year um what would you say when someone's got a bit of dragon that's actively like asleep this time of year in the northern hemisphere they shouldn't be get it checked out by a vet um if as in sleeping as in like brumation type sleeping yes yeah. That, yeah i would definitely get it checked out um you know this is their active season um i think we've just come past the summer solstice so you know there will be some reduction of activity males their testes are shrunk um, and they're at a point where, you know, they're not worried too much about territory. So it is, you know, it's the summertime. They're meant to be more active and at least alert. If they're not alert, get it checked out by vet, find out everything's going well. 
a lot of the time, um, if it's sleeping, it, it could be sick females that have are egg bound or have a rotten egg inside them. Um, you know, they go lethargic. Um, the peak of the summer. So we also get, you know, in this estivation time, it's a stressful time for them as well. And their intestinal parasites increase as well, just because their body's under stress. And if they've, the intestinal parasites have gone out of control, um, it's causing pain and lethargy as well. So, um, yeah, definitely get it checked out. Um, get bloods done if, um, that's what's required by the, what the vet thinks and then get to the bottom of it because, yeah, no, they shouldn't, when they estivate, they're still alert. They're not, you know, it's not the same state as a brumation. So they still like stick your head in there. The ones that, you know, in the hottest of summer and we found them, they, they still, they'll see you and they'll take off, but they're just, you know, in a rest, resting state, trying to stay out of direct sun and stuff like that. They just really want to sit in the corner and stay as cool as possible. The clip you've just watched is just a snippet of a larger podcast episode where we had Beadvet on the podcast. If you want to find the full podcast episode, you can find that up here. Or if you want to carry on looking through the Beadvet Explained series, you can find the rest of it down here.